That being said, it's been a tremendous blessing and conviction for me uh, to get into this study of Proverbs. Um, when we, we started this, it was a little hard because I was like, what do I preach on? Um, and Brandon had brought to the table and said, hey, let's do Proverbs. That'll be great. And I'm going, ooh, those, those, there's themes there and, and there are things there. And it's kind of wisdom statements, right? We're, we're kind of looking at short, quick, kind of pithy ooh, statements. And I was like, what do I, what do I teach on? It's a little tough uh, because you have... In the text, we can see that there's wisdom, there's relationship issues, all kinds of things. And I kind of worked my way down, and he gave us kind of some things to go with, and I saw contentment. I thought, ah, I can do that one. I can do that one. Yeah, that was a little tougher than I thought it would be. Uh, and, and, and I wasn't content with it, needless to say, right? Um, but it's really good. As we look at Proverbs, we notice that the book contains a lot of different themes, right? And, and, and contentment um, is something in our, we have a, a great struggle with today. Uh, one, looking at Proverbs, one commentator said that Proverbs kind of deals with the gray areas in life, right? It's not so black and white. So how do we handle that? And especially when we're looking at this theme of contentment, um, we really want to focus in on what God is saying and how he is using contentment in these areas. Uh, so as we get started, I would like to say that contentment, for me, is a problem and has been a problem. And you all know what I'm talking about as you get on your phones and you scroll through something looking at ads that pop up, and then they hit you and you're like, wait a minute, and it shoots you over in this direction, and next thing you know, you've lost an hour worth of time doing who knows what, looking at things you shouldn't be, and you're not happy. It just continues and continues and continues. So I always look and go, man, I could have had that. I wanted that. This is the cool things that the haves and the have-nots. And, and you know what I'm talking about. For example, if, if for me, I didn't realize that I really needed a luxury uh, Lexus or, well, more importantly, uh, a Lincoln town car or a Lincoln car in general. I didn't realize that until I saw Matthew McConaughey one day running through these tall trees, sweating and I was like, wow, that, that's, that's kind of nice. And then I see him on another one, and I see him. He's got a suit and tie on, or no tie. He's just a suit, like probably a really expensive suit. And he walks out of a party very calm, very collective, and he just kind of falls into a pool. I don't know what that's about, but it was neat. And my favorite probably is when, when he, 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 he goes fishing, and, and he, he walks out. He, you know exactly which one I'm talking about. He cranks up the heat. He kind of walks out on the ice. He's got his fur coat on fur neck thing, drills his hole, he drops his fishing line, they say it's jigging, but I don't wanna say that because probably people didn't know what that meant, but he's fishing, right? He goes back to this SUV, this aviator, I need this truck, right? And <laughs> he's sitting there and he starts drawing the mountains in the background, snow, I don't even know why this is here, but he's drawing this and, and I'm just like, wow. And I know that that truck can't make it there. The street tires would not allow it to get to that location. And I, <laughs> and I know that he can't draw that well. I guarantee you there was a model drawing that, you know, but that's not what they're trying to tell me. It's not what they're trying to tell me. What they're trying to tell me is that I need that vehicle. I need that Lincoln. I, I need that experience. I need that adventure, right? I need that. That's what they're selling me. You see, they want me to think that there's this simple life that can be attained by this object. They want you to feel like you gained something. And of course, commercial starts you that way, right? It's just a snapshot in time. But then it pushes over into its evil cousin, social media, right? Where there, I get to covet my neighbor's stuff, and I get to compare them and feel really bad about the things I don't have. So now I'm discontent again, right? The, the entire world is screaming to us, it's not enough. It's not enough. It never will be enough. If you only had this job, if you had this relationship, if you had this education, if you had this position, this wage, this ability, this skill set, if you only had this authority, this group of friends, this spouse, if I only, if I go back to Genesis, if I only had that fruit, if I had the fruit, if I had the knowledge, if I only had that. See, everything has a beginning. Discontentment is part of our life. It's something that is always eating at us. So, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs. 
Particularly, uh, we will be looking at a few verses, Proverbs 3 and, Proverbs 3 and 30. Uh, we're going to kind of line it up starting there and ending there. We're going to start with the wisest man to ever live and another one, which is the self-proclaimed uh, idiot, stupidest man to ever live. That's what he says. So we've got a broad range, and then we're going to pack a couple texts in there as well as we go along. The book of Proverbs has a couple authors. Now, most of it is directly and indirectly is authored by King Solomon. King Solomon is a great individual uh, for us to analyze. He brings much weight and mystery to this idea of contentment. If you remember, God asked Solomon, what do you want? He's going to ask him, here's a wish. Now, I've asked my kids and them, what would they want with one wish? It's horrible. It's not this. Let's look at 2 Chronicles uh, 1, 7 through 10. In that night, God appeared to Solomon, and he said to him, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to David my father, and have made me king in his place. O oh, Lord God, let your word to David my father be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before these, this people. For who can govern this, this people of yours, which is so great? God answered Solomon, because this, is what is, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for possession, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. Wow. So here, Solomon asks for wisdom. I won't go deep into wisdom. Uh, Pastor Sean has gone through this. We know that wisdom is uh, looked at and explained as uh, this experience, right? This, this knowledge that we apply, right? And, and Richard went a little bit further and explained that there is divine wisdom and then there's worldly wisdom, right? The, the divine wisdom we're seeing here, worldly wisdom, he'd mention would, would be like the early bird gets the worm. I tried that today. It didn't work out. My alarm didn't go off. So <laughs> well, hopefully this works out. Or I have a bird in the hand, and there's, it's better to have a bird in the hand than two in the bush, right? There's the wisdom. So Solomon here is saying, hey, we need wisdom. And, and being the wisest man that had ever lived, he had wealth beyond our imagination, nothing we can even think of. You know, I have a garden in my backyard, plants and all this, and it's nice. You know, I think I've got something going. There's other people that are way better than me. But Solomon, when he did a garden, he did a forest. Right? It wasn't small. It was big, very big. And he would have lakes that would have streams that would feed these gardens. He had homes, but it wasn't like our home. I could build a shed. He would have mansions, large mansions. He had workers. He had Warriors, workers, any wives? I don't know exactly how that one works. I'm not going to touch that. That's, that's off limits. Nonetheless, he acquired an experience more than anyone else on this planet. If you remember, he authored Ecclesiastes, and the whole book was a reflection on Solomon and what was the purpose of life. It was very difficult. He's trying to struggle through this. He has everything, and he's walking through us. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 17. It says, I said in my heart, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who, who were over Jerusalem. Wait, let's try this again. I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. So if anyone knew what it was like to have everything, his heart's desire, and to be fully content, one would think that it would be King Solomon. So let's look at our text that we're going to currently be focusing on, Proverbs 30, or 3, 1 through 7. My son, do not forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean onto your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. 
Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You see, King Solomon here is pleading with his son. He's saying, don't forget my teaching. Don't forget this wisdom. This pattern seems to be, or this, this seems to be a pattern for the father uh, looking to this future king. In this situation, we notice that he uses these phrases over tw- 20 times throughout the Proverbs. We read phrases such as, my son, if you receive my words, or hear my son, your father's instructions. Uh, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. My son, if you receive my words, my son, do not forget my teaching. O oh, sons, a father's instruction. Hear my son and accept my words. My son, be attentive to my words. My son, keep your father's commandments. I think you get the point. There, there's, a, there's a strong emphasis on paying attention. And it's not like some of our fathers. This is the wisest man to ever live. So, I mean, you kind of look, well, I can't, what do I say about this? You're going to lean into this, right? The king has something important to say, and he's trying to drive it home. He's trying to get to this mystery and tell his son, as being a king, there are things you're going to need to know, and the joys and struggles in life are going to come. You need to understand where you're leaning. He's telling him to put all of your trust in something, but we know that Solomon has tried everything under the sun. He says this uh, in the beginning of Ecclesiastes. He says it's all vanity. So now we run into a problem. Here, these are the things I want you to know, but guess what? You're going to want to go here, and this is all vanity. He restates that again in Ecclesiastes uh, 2.1. I said in my heart, come now, and I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this also is vanity. He pleads with his son to understand that as a future king, he will experience trials, tribulations, and the answer is not going to be in his understanding and his will. It's not going to work for you that way. Let's look back at verses 3 uh, and 7 through 7. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablets of your heart. My son, take this truth that is God's truth and hold on to it. Place it here. Use it. So that you may find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. This, this truth that I'm giving you is God's truth. It's a good truth. It's the right truth. And you obviously will get favor with God because it's his, but it applies to man in your situations. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. This is not for you to do on your own. Put your faith not in yourself. Trust in him. He is good. Trust him with everything. Don't look to yourself. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. There's a trajectory he's taking you. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Solomon understood that actual favor and success came from God, and that applied to man. He encourages his son to follow the Lord and his laws and keep them close. He knows that if he follows his own heart, what the consequences for that would be. There's a history there. He knew that if his, if his circumstances and his heart's desires is what he sought for, that it would not bring him satisfaction and it would bring him to ruin. It would not be a straight path. How many of you as children are super excited about Christmas morning? I might be the only one in the room, but I remember Christmas morning, and if, you're, if you were allowed to have a parent that allowed you to believe in Santa Claus, you might have been up late the night before kind of listening. It's weird. That's a different conversation. But <laughs> you're up late at night. You've already looked at the presents. You've kind of like sized them up. You've already probably peeled back tape. You're trying to figure out what's going on because there's this one that really caught your eye. I've been waiting forever. Right? You wake up the next morning. You get everybody up. You either dart downstairs or shoot out to the Christmas tree or wherever you're keeping these things, and you want to get to that one. You want to get to that when your mom kind of like, hey, take this one. And I'll take this one. But you're like, I want to get to that one. For me, uh, that thing was a, a 1982 uh, Castle Grayskull Fortress of Mystery and Power. <laughs> yes, I am an 80s baby. And that thing was like everything to me as a child. I woke up. I'm thinking about it, breaking it open. I played with that thing forever, <laughs> outside, inside. I don't know when it actually fell off my radar, mm-hmm. But it was the thing to have. Not so long ago, last year actually, it was Christmas time, and I was in Target, and I turned around, and 
It was like a beam of light came down, and there it was. I don't know where it came from in the time warp, but there it was. And I went over, I looked at it, and of course, you know, a remake is never the same. I'm flipping this box around. I don't, I don't know what I was searching for, but now I'm back to this. And I'm looking at it, and it's exactly like I remember it, everything. Of course, I take a picture of it. I send it to my wife. I'm like, how, how do I get this? How did this come home with me? And, and my wife, in her uh, wisdom, said, we don't have room for that. You don't need that. Don't bring that home. Now, of course, I did not bring that home because my wife knew what I wasn't thinking clearly about at the time. That's not going to bring me satisfaction. It didn't then. It did now. But that's where we are, right? It doesn't bring us satisfaction or contentment. Now, we've probably gotten this far along, and you're like, what is contentment? We're just using this word, right? I'm glad you asked. So for that answer, let's look to a 16th century Puritan named Jeremiah Burroughs. He defines contentment as this. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Man, that's a pretty comprehensive definition. See, this is what King Solomon was urging his son to do and look at. By putting to trust in the Lord and his righteous path and depending on him in all dimensions of his life, no matter what the circumstances... But sadly, it was of no avail. His son did not listen. His son Rehoboam fell as a king. He lived for himself, forsaking his father's instructions, and the kingdom fell. So, not good for us. Contentment is not found within us. If I didn't mention, we're looking at actually three men today. That was the first one. So let's take, another, let's take a look at another example. Turn with me to Philippians 4. Here we have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, this one should be no surprise. Apostle Paul has been through much turmoil in his life. He has been nearly beaten to death. He has been shipwrecked. He, have, he has been placed in prison. He has been put in shackles and chains. He will be abandoned by his friends, and he will be put to death. I think this is a good place to start looking for contentment. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, it says this, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In, every, in, 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 in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, Paul has learned to be content in all and every circumstance. It didn't depend upon his wealth, his poverty, his status, or his hunger, his comfort. As he reminds us in 1 Corinthians 4, it says, to, be pres- to this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and homeless. He knows what it's like to be low. He knows what it's like. His contentment and his joy or his satisfaction came from something else. It didn't come from inside of him. It was not a, a self-willed thing. If we look back at 13, we can ask, well, where did it come from? Him who strengthens me. Now, I went to a Christian school and played sports. And it always, I always thought it was funny and just drove me nuts when we would go compete against other schools. Because I know we were saying probably the same thing. We're praying to God for our victory. We're using this verse. Like, oh, I can do all things. It strengthens me. Let's go and let's play this game. I, I see the same thing with, with MMA fighters. Um, if you're not into MMA, that's okay. It's a sanctification thing I'm working through. It is what it is. Uh, but I'll see tattoos. I'll have this verse tattooed on their chest. Or at the end of a fight, I'll see them, you know, I can do all things to him. Strengthen me. I'm like, okay, great. That's not. <sighs> the first thing that comes to my mind uh, <laughs> is <laughs> Inigo Montoya. <laughs> Princess Bride, we've already established I'm an 80s baby, right? <laughs> when he says, he says this wonderful statement, you keep using that word. You keep using that verse. I, I, I do not think it means what you think it means, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is not for personal gain. This is not for personal gain. This is not what Paul is saying, right? He's, he's not... <sighs> Anyhow, Paul made it through his persecution, his per- personal weakness, looking to Christ for his strength. He endured those trials and hardships, uh, by the strength of Christ for Christ, right? This wasn't a personal gain thing. 
Paul loved Christ. He, it was, he was his master, and his whole entire life was his until he joined him, right? Yeah, the, the prayer, and the woman said, if I must die, I'm, gonna, I'm here, and I'm going to die for Christ until I meet him. It just, that was not here ad lib. Perfect, though. That, that's a perfect example. That's what we're looking at. Christ, Paul is saying, nothing in this life matters. Nothing you can give me. Paul says this in Philippians 1, 20, through, uh, 1, 20 and 21. It is, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We've all heard that. The apostles' love, loyalty, and life were in Christ. That was his strength. That was his anchor. Anything outside of that didn't matter. Everything was about Christ. This was his treasure. This was his everything. I love this quote. The worth and excellence of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. By the object of its love. What is the object of your love? Paul's was Christ. He anchored himself to that. It was his object. It was everything to him. Contentment didn't matter in his sense. or Discontent wasn't a thing. See, Paul understood that God's providence had him here. His expectations weren't here. That, that's how it happens, just in case you wanted to know. I'm off script, so I'm probably going to be out of time. This... This idea is God has placed me here in a situation. My expectations are here, and we need to take those expectations and bring them down to where God has us, knowing that God is good and that he is watching over me and maintaining everything for me. Paul was fully committed to Christ, trusting him alone for his joy, his pleasure, and his provisions. Christ was the exclusive object of Paul's affections. Christ was not some means to an end. He wasn't trying to get through Christ to something else. He did not seek Christ for that. Christ was his treasure, his purpose for life, and nothing outside of that mattered. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10 says this, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecution, and calamity. For when I am weak, I am strong. For the sake of Christ, he endured. He had that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame that was being directed by the Father's disposal. He was at the Father's disposal to do what the Father wanted him to do, and it was good. Because of Paul's love and obedience to Christ, Paul was submissive to the Father in any way, shape, or form. He found joy in his circumstances, no matter what that was, and that the Lord was pleased in him. Remember Paul in Acts 16 said this, and when they had inflicted, which we read this earlier, he had inflicted, when they had been inflicted, I'm going to get this right, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I can imagine sitting in a dark, broken area, no lights, we're not, you know. Uh, by the way, you were paying for this prison sentence too. You're there. This is not like, you know, you get a free ride. The, the, the shackles are hurtful. They're not just like here. They're usually contorted, so your muscles are starting to break down. They're in pain, and they pray and start to sing. I can imagine in the room what that must have been like. People lost in hope because they're in prison, and here they begin to sing and praise God. And the outcome of that is the jailers listened was the jailer's salvation with his family for Christ's glory. He wasn't complaining. He knew that this was temporary. This was for God. Paul rooted himself in this truth and had no basis 
for hope in himself. He knew that his strength was in the bind, and he was nothing without Christ. Oh, I skipped that part. In, Christ, in, in John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I am him, in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Paul knew that and was anchored to Christ. He was drinking from the stream. Let's move on to the last man in our study. We've come a long way to get to Agar, the self-proclaimed village idiot. That's me. It's not really what it says, but it's just what happened in my mind when I was thinking through this. Uh, We don't have much information about Agar. Uh, We really don't know. He kind of just arrives on the scene and is out of the scene. It's his only place here in the scriptures. And um, some would say that he he could have been a city official. Uh, It seemed like he was maybe talking. could be sons. It could be others. But what we do know is that he says that he is, uh, he describes himself as actually too stupid to be a man. He describes himself that way. Let's turn to Proverbs 30, 30, 1 through 4. The words of Agar, uh, son of uh, Jacob, Jacob, Uh, the oracle. The man declared, I am weary, O God, I am weary, O God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. There it is. I have not understand I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One, who has ascended to heaven and who has come down, who has gathered the winds in his fist, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. Wow, what an intro, right? I'm the dumbest guy alive. I just want you to know I'm too stupid to be a man. Basically saying I'm a brute. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I, I know nothing. And what I don't know is that I don't know anything about this holy one. He's coming to the table, and he is lowering himself right away. He understands and knows his heart is evil and that it's important. Uh, and this is important when concerning our study on contentment. Let's continue. Verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you, found, uh, and you be found a liar. Two things I ask of you, de- deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Here we see a man that is confident in the Lord's providence in his life. He points uh, to the very thing that we started with, right? The sufficiency of the scriptures, the truth of the scripture. Don't mess with it. This is truth. Here you go. So he lowers his frame, and he comes straight at it with, this is what you need to know. No different than Solomon. It's sufficient for all things. Being low, we can also look at his posture, and we could tie that back to what Burroughs said as well. He has a submissive, sweet, lowered frame before God. Look at the last portion of text here, 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Agar asked two things. One is a moral of a moral nature. I don't want to be a man of bad character. I don't want to lie. And if we catch this beforehand, he says, before I die, I'm praying this. He recognizes that when you die, it's done. It's over. So before I die, Lord, I want to be this man. I want to be the man that doesn't lie, the man that has character, the man that walks in your ways, right? The second half of that portion is a physical convenience, right? Give me food. Don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. This is not him saying, well, I'm commanding, like, here's what I'm looking for. He, he's not giving a, a range. He's saying, I trust whatever you give me. Give me the, the, what is ever too high or too low. I don't know. But don't give me something that could tempt me to walk away from you, to say these things about you. Who is God? If I'm too rich... I don't need you. If I'm too poor, I may steal and go against you and then even curse you. He's saying, Lord, give me what you want me to have so I can worship you and trust because you are everything to me. He keeps his trust in the Lord and he trusts what the Lord gives him. 
How often do we do that? How often do we say, Lord, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know what this is, but take it. Give me what you think I need. Often, right? God puts us here. Expectations are here. We're not going to be happy. Lord, bring me to where you are. Bring me to where you are so that I can make much of you. So then, what should we take away from these three men? There's three things. I didn't have a lot of points. I'm going to be pretty easy on this one, but here you go. Three points. Uh, first, when we're looking at Christ, Christ is trustworthy and sovereign. We can trust him. We can trust that he will take our lives, like Paul, like uh, King Solomon, trusting in him, saying, here's my life. Whatever you seek to do with it, so be it. That's the frame. I am at your disposal. You are sovereign. Your word is good. I trust whatever you say. Christ is everything and our treasure. Is he your treasure? See, Paul's life, he looked at Christ and said, you are my treasure. You are the treasure in the field that I'm looking for. I will give anything for it. I want you. I love this. Um, he, he, he's hitting the Westminster Confession really well here. It says, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. How often do we forget that there are other things in our peripheral? We're not, we're not paying attention to that. Is Christ everything to you, and are you worshiping him with everything you have? Is he your object of affection and love? And the last is Christ is sufficient. He's sufficient. You need nothing else. Agar said, whatever you give me, whatever you give me, whatever food it is, whatever experience, whatever's happening, I trust you. You are sufficient for all my needs. You are the bread of life. I take it. Dispose of me as you will but I have you and you alone. Paul the same, all rolls up, even King Solomon. If you find yourself discontent in this world, you are believing Satan's lie. You are. He's saying it's not enough, you're not enough. Brothers and sisters, if this is the case today, you will never find joy or satisfaction. You won't. There's no clothes you can wear, there's no relationship you can have, there's no job you can get. There's no summer home you can attain. There's no resume you can build. There's no job you can get hired for. There's no vehicle you can buy. There's no talent you can perfect. There's no physique you can build. There's no beauty you can go after. There's no group you can be a part of. And there is no knowledge you can receive. I'm not going to ask you today if you have a relationship with God. See, we all have a relationship with Him. <coughs> We all have a relationship with him. The question is, what is your relationship with him? Is he the means to your end? Is he an ATM, a genie in the bottle? The one to make you comfortable? Is he the one that is going to give you the things you need, give you your desire? If he is, you need to analyze that relationship. You need to analyze that relationship. See, he's not just that. He's not that. See, he's also the judge. He's a righteous judge that is going to bring justice, and he is going to judge a rebellious individual. If he's not the object of your affection, if he's not the treasure of your field, the joy and satisfaction, the master and Lord, and the savior of your life, then you are a broken sinner separated from him and the judge you should be worried about. You need Christ, you need God. You need him. He's the only one that can restore relationship and he can make you right in, in front of this judge. He's the only one that can pay that debt, and he does that on the cross. Is your relationship with Christ the judge or the Savior? Is he the judge or is he your Father? Is Christ enough for you? Is Christ alone the object of your love and affection? Or is there something else? Is Christ not enough? I encourage you 
to repent and seek him today if he is not. You see, God is a jealous God, and he is alone, and he and he alone deserves our undivided attention and worship. Nothing else will satisfy you, only Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for uh, the wisdom that comes out of this Proverbs, Lord. Forgive us where we have taken your creation, where we have taken the things that are good, Lord, and placed them as the object of our affection, where we've idolized these things. We've, we've moved you off and away from our hearts, and we've placed them there, where we have divided your love and attention amongst all types of things rather than having you be our complete desire and love. Where our affections are not where you have us, Lord, forgive us. We thank you, Lord, for your son, his work on the cross. I pray, Lord, that we would grow to be more like him. It's in your precious son's name we praise you and we thank you. Amen.